So here we are at a pivotal point. We're in the 400th anniversary year of the sailing of the Mayflower. And we're sitting in the Alma pub here in Harwich. And this pub was actually owned by Christopher Jones, the master of the Mayflower's wife. I formulated PCT Hub just over a year ago, which is essentially um, outreach functioning for the needs of the community. So people come to us with their needs and we look to find social solutions. That's now registered as a community interest company. And I was offered free office space by some friends in Miranda House. And that kind of really touched me in a number of ways, not least the fact that as a child I visited there with my Trinity House pilot father. It was the headquarters at the time for the pilot service out of Harwich. And I would go there with my father. He would pick up his jobs and his maps and this kind of thing. So it's got a sentimental element to it. My childhood was extremely violent, uh, violent in the home. Uh, my father was a very broken man and, and violent. He was an alcoholic and school life was, was extremely violent, the Catholic school that I went to. So it was, it was physical attacks on me all the way through my childhood. Then at the age of 13 and a half, my father committed suicide. And um, within 18 months, my life had completely changed. I'd gone from an innocent schoolboy to a fully fledged street hooligan. So I looked around for a resolution to that, recognising that I needed some discipline and um, decided to join Essex Police at the age of 20. When I joined the police force on my first day, which was the 9th of October 1978, I was issued with the police number 1149, 1149. Around the age of 42, my life started to crumble on the faulty foundation of childhood, really. Um, I'd entered into active alcoholism um, and uh, ended up in a psychiatric unit for a spell with a suicide, with a suicide, not, an, not a suicide attempt. It was a suicide that went wrong because God had other ideas. And consequently, some friends took me to a monastery in northern France, the Taizé Monastery in northern France. And it was at that point in my life that after doing some work on myself, uh, repetitive work through the program of Alcoholics Anonymous that I had a spiritual experience and uh, was given a particular prayer. And that prayer being, Lord Jesus, open my mind like a child that I may come to know and love you more and more. So I was asking God to open my mind. I knew I was bigoted by a number of things and that's what started to happen. After I'd left the police, I was uh, kind of wandering a little bit and then through some security work, I ended up working with museum services in Ipswich uh, and in Christchurch Mansion. And it was there that I kind of started uh, a love and a passion for heritage. I would have never taken any interest in it before that. I didn't know anything about Jamestown. I certainly didn't know that the leader of Jamestown was a Harwich man, Christopher Newport. So all this started to develop a passion in me, but it focused me back to Harwich. I knew about the Mayflower story, but didn't know the spiritual significance of these two expeditions and really started to investigate those more and more and research them. Um, I feel that there's been some remarkable things happen and my eyes have been opened to all sorts of things. Um, one of those things is the uh, spiritual gifts that were promised once we're filled with the Holy Spirit. And one of those gifts is the gift of administration. And um, I was really inspired when a, a vicar friend of mine, very good friend of mine, Dave Beals, um, enlightened me around that spiritual gift and the Greek word, uh, kubinesis, uh, which means pilot. So although my career might well have been in pilotage, just like my forebears, six, seven generations of pilots, it wasn't. It was in the police force. But there I was, being an administrator and navigating my way through complex matters. And it feels like those skills are something that God has used for me to research. These two pilots, these two Harwich men that delivered the Bible to the shores of America 400 years ago. Captain Christopher Newport and Master Christopher Jones of the Mayflower. Um, so I'll just start something, a process off now of a trail that I feel my supernatural father God has laid out for me. I put a health warning out here now that be careful what you pray for, you might get it. And what I was asking for after that Taze experience was my mind to be opened like a child. 
And that's what happened. My mind started to be opened just like a child and I became teachable. And my father, God, knew how to get my attention. And one of the things that I believe he's done is he's given me a whole series of interventions and directives through my police number. And um, one was uh, my attending district council tax form with my police number on it, 1149. Another example which was so, so comforting, so emotive, was when my wife Sally died. I went to check her bank account and we'd been estranged because of her alcoholism for some time and I expected there to be a deficit in the account and there wasn't. There was £1,149 in the account. I went to a Christian conference on addiction in Manchester. I decided to get the train from my, son house, my son's house to the conference. When I came out of the conference, the trains had broken down and they'd put on a bus service. And when I was directed to my bus, the bus number was 1149 and the company was called Tires. Well, I checked my tires when I got back to my son's and I had a chunk out of the side wall of one of the tires that I just wouldn't have known of. So I waited and before I left for Essex, I got the tyre changed. Some extraordinary events have drawn me to the relevance of Mayflower in terms, and, and Jamestown in terms of the deliverance of Israel. Now that's quite an extraordinary leap to make. And one of the key scripture relevant to that is from Isaiah and it's at 27 and it speaks of the Leviathan spirit. In that day, the Lord will punish with his sword his fierce, great and powerful sword, Leviathan, the gliding serpent, Leviathan, the coiling serpent, he will slay the monster of the sea in that day. And it goes on, sing about the fruitful vineyard. I, the Lord, watch over it. I water it continually. I guard it day and night so that no one may harm it. I am not angry if only there were briars and thorns confronting me. What God is talking about there is the re-establishment of Israel, the vineyard. My own interpretation of that is that there's been a spiritual interference in that through the Leviathan spirit. The Leviathan spirit is the twister and the twister of the truth. So we've moved away from the actual relevance of Israel and the alia, the return of the Jews to Israel. And I feel that God has guided me on that in so many different ways. One of which was when I was working for museums, I befriended uh, an artist and he would invite me to his exhibitions. He invited me to one particular one in Salt House on the North Norfolk coast. The cemetery in Ipswich, the Jewish cemetery in Ipswich is in Salt House Street. But then when I looked at the map of how to get there, I was gonna drive on the B1149. And I went to the art exhibition in St. Nicholas Church there and I walked in and there was an, an installation, an art installation on the aisle and essentially that sculpture was a rope, a thick rope, and it was decorated with beach debris. And what I saw there was Leviathan spirit that had been destroyed by the sword because it had no tail and it had no head. And I believed that that was what God was telling me, that the Leviathan spirit, that lying spirit had been killed on that day. But it was contributory to the truths of the Pilgrim Fathers and how they were trying to re-establish the true church. That's why they were persecuted. That's why they had to leave these shores for America. But then one of the possibly the most powerful messages around this, around God's chosen people, was when I was watching a TV program and a little girl popped up, a Holocaust survivor. And she bared her arm and showed her, holog her holocaust, uh, sorry, her um, concentration camp tattoo. And of course it was my number, her number, 1149. This told me that I'd got a ministry to the Jews, a loyalty to their truths, their festivals, their ways, uh, a need to have people, Christian people, understand two main things that it's our duty to provoke them to jealousy about Messiah and secondly the concept of, of being one new man one new man Gentile and Jew being fully grafted on 
and another conviction around all of this and being a Roman Catholic, the name Martin Luther would stick in my, my throat. Um, but starting to look and investigate the meaning of uh, the Pilgrim Fathers and what they were about and why they did what they did, why they were persecuted, I looked from, for information on YouTube on Martin Luther and I found a nice short video that's uh, very succinct and meaningful. Uh, Martin Luther and the Reformation in 11 minutes, 49 seconds. So it was confirmation that this was the way that I was to go. So I've produced a tour company, deciding to call it the Gateways of Zion, and examine the meanings of, of that and where these gateways are. And of course, Harwich uh, was a gateway to 10,000 Jewish children who were rescued from Nazi Germany and brought to Harwich and billeted here. And another confirmation for me around all of this was um, the 2012 Olympics. I was asked to lead the Olympic flame into Colchester Town Centre. And the irony was that the torch was leaving my former workplace at Christchurch Mansion, where essentially all of this started for me. And specifically, I was to hand it over at Sally's the hairdressers at the bottom of East Hill. And that was my wife's name. Sally and she was a hairdresser so I told her and I said meet me there and that's where I handed over the Olympic flame which I believe God was using to ignite his church in this country I believe that God anointed that flame and I believe that God supernaturally had his emblem put on that flame because when you examine the actual design of the 2012 uh, branding, it spells out Zion one way and 2012 another. Uh, when I related the 1149 sequence to a young friend of mine, he did what young people do and he googled the number. And he was excited with what he found because right in the heart of the area in America where the Pilgrim Fathers prospered, he found a restaurant. And the restaurant is called the 1149 restaurant just south of Boston. Another discovery when he Googled was Alden's Boatyard in Rhode Island. At the time of Googling, they had 11 of their 49 model yachts for sale. The significance there as well is that John Alden was on the Mayflower. He was a Harwich man. And John Alden of Harwich was the first man to set foot on Plymouth Rock. So I feel compelled to visit the 1149 restaurant and it would be lovely to track down the Holocaust survivor with the tattoo 1149 on her arm. And well, I would just love to buy her a meal. And in that sense, be one new man before God with her over a meal in the 1149 restaurant. So I've catalogued all these. And the whole thing really has led me back to Harwich and back to what I believe to be a font of the origins of American Christianity in St. Nicholas Church. And that is the font where Christopher Newport was undoubtedly christened, because the record still exists, but also Christopher Jones was christened. That is disputed. That is disputed because the records are missing, but it's what I would refer to as axiomatic history. His family all celebrated births, marriages and deaths right the way through their lives in that church. So really, uh, members of the jury, you know, that sums up the evidence for the prosecution. And the prosecution is really that we decide whether we need to return to core scriptural truths and whether we start to need, we need to start presenting those truths more emphatically in the Christian church. For example, there is a nativity story, but there is no requirement for us to celebrate that nativity story. Uh, the more, more of the emphasis is on the death and resurrection of Jesus, not his birth. Should we be doing that? Or should we be looking at Passover and all the deep meanings of Passover and the prophecies that are contained in the Seder meal? Is this the way we should be provoking the Jewish people to jealousy and becoming one man with them? 
But we then look at the teachings of Paul when he, he says to us emphatically, criticize no man for the meats he eats, feasts he celebrates, and many other scriptures of that nature where we, we don't judge. Uh, I ask you to examine what I've presented to you and as Jesus did in his teaching with it, through his parables, make your own decision. That ends the prosecution case.